um, Chandor Tot, University of Washington. Um, I am an associate professor of natural resource informatics, and um, I feel a little bit awkward here because I created my presentation two weeks ago because uh, uh, Mason wanted it, wanted to test it to see if it would work. But after seeing Cecilia's, John's, and Raman's presentation, I wish I could rebuild my presentation because there's so much that you've provided that I could use as a foundation for my talk to, to, to deliver a stronger impact to this audience, and I can't do it. I wish I had some sort of uh, human-centered uh, graphical interface here, uh, here with which I could, I, I could change it. But, but here's what I have. This is uh, the main campus of the University of Washington. I like to use this picture because there is a little bit of a beam of light coming in, and it reminds me of one line in uh, Leonard Cohen, one of my favorite poets, uh, a poem, the anthem. Um, there's a crack in everything, and that's where the light comes in. So I, ideally, I try to, to believe that uh, uh, University of Washington or any, any institution of higher education is, is a place where, where there are cracks, lots of cracks, but we do recognize that that's also an opportunity to, to investigate the truth. So, um, University of Washington, I'm the College of the Environment. It's a recently created uh, a conglomeration of various units, space, sciences, aquatics, forestry, and so I am in the forestry and environmental sciences unit within that bigger college. Um, and here are my um, distinguished ho hosts, and one of them is here, uh, Professor Andres Weintraub. Do you want to say something, Andres? Uh, you Briefly, he's something. from <laughs> University of Chile. Well, we've been collaborating uh, for years. Uh, the integration of operations research in forestry has been very successful. It has lasted for about 40 years. Industry uses it a lot which doesn't happen in all natural resources. And there are two basic avenues. One is more methodological, one is more applied, but they intersect a lot. And Sander is one of the leading uh, academics in this area. He's done excellent work. So for us, it, it's great to have him for a year with us. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, I, I also have to say here that my, my hosts, um, Andres and Marcos Goikulia from Universidad um, Adolfo Ibanez, yes. um, very generous. I've, I, we've, we've been here since January, and we've, we've had an amazing time. Uh, thank you so much, Andres, for your hospitality and generosity. Um, so uh, this presentation is going to be about, um, I, I wanted to focus on what I want to do here in Chile, but I will try to mix in some of the stuff that I had done in the past. Um, but yeah, forest management in particular, but any time we try to to look at uh, complex environmental natural systems, we try to figure out uh, you know what to do in order to best meet some of the management objectives that uh, either the society or a private landowner decision makers uh, would like to see. And so very often in these systems, there is a conflict between those objectives. So if you think about a, a, a public piece of forest land, some people want uh, more timber production because perhaps some of their uh, um, sawmills depend on the output of, of these systems, but other one, others want to protect wildlife habitat, yet others would like to see the, the forest play more of a role of, of climate mitigation through carbon sequestration. And so here I just listed some of the critical issues that are unique to, to Chile. Um, Mega fires, you've experienced some of those last year. Um, some connect this to climate change. Whatever the cause is, there has, we have to, to look at these, these forests, especially the plantations in Chile, and see how we can manage them in such a way so that they would, the resulting landscape would be more resilient to these fires, whatever the cause is. Um, Loss of native forest habitat, that's also a, a historical problem here in Chile. Plantation forest replaced native, native forest vegetation. Uh, and there's a lot of ecological value in these forests. So can we do anything about the plantations, making them more efficient so there would be less of a, of a demand, less of a pressure on uh, 
the remaining native forest to, to be converted to other uses. Um, and so, one of the interesting things in Chile, and, 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 and those of you who've lived here uh, for a while, you, you might uh, immediately recognize there's this, this binary uh, situation with, with respect to forest management in Chile, which is quite different from that of the United States or Europe, but more similar to New Zealand, whereby you either have a forest plantation which focuses on commodity production, or you have a native forest system where they are almost always protected. Uh, from um, from management activities. That's not always the case, but it's roughly that's um, and, and you can probably tell based on these two pictures which one is which, right? And so in this collaboration, we try to look at plantation forests and see if we can make the operations in these plantation forests more efficient, not only to 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 produce more timber or more net revenues, but also to try to, to manipulate them in such a way so that they would lead to uh, more forest ecosystem services outside of timber. Um, so my field is in spatial optimization, and Andres is also, has also done a lot of work, a whole lot more, more work, actually, than, than myself in this area. But, but um, Spatial optimization is, well, discrete mathematics. You talked about discrete mathematics. Yeah. It's, uh, we try to build prescriptive models. You also men mentioned prescriptive models to decide what to do in a, in a complex forest system. And, and in order to answer the question of what to do, we try to figure out what sort of operations to do and where and when. So it's both a, a spatial and a temporal prescriptive model. And there are many decisions to be made, not just where to cut one of these uh, these polygons or not, but how to do it, which ones to save, which ones to preserve for wildlife habitat, and and also how to get to these these forest units. There has to be a forest road network to allow uh, the extraction of timber, for example, or firefighting efforts. It also turns out that the fires that occurred in Chile last year, most of them were started close to forest roads. So we are trying to see how we can model uh, this situation in such a way so that as we schedule the spatial temporal allocation of activities across the landscape and over time, we end up creating a system that is more, both productive but is also more resilient to these undesirable uh, natural disturbances such as fire. So, why we, we like this topic is because spatial optimization, as, as we mentioned, it's discrete, requires disc, discrete mathematics to model. And, and discrete mathematics is very exciting because it's more like a puzzle. Okay, how do I, how do I play with these, 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 these building blocks of units in time, units over space? How, we, how do we reshuffle them? How do we describe the relationships between them in an efficient, but very powerful mathematical way so that we can analyze these systems and make them work better. And so very often, this is, I, I just see this is just a continuation of, of my childhood hobby of recreational mathematics, you know, playing chess and doing things like that. This is, in, in many ways, it's similar. So, so that's spatial optimization. Now, I made my career, big career based on the notion that, that many of these management objectives conflict with each other. The more timber we try to get out, the more wildlife habitat is damaged, right? And, and, and so the question is, can we quantify these trade-offs? Can, can we quantify the conflict that exists behind these various management objectives? And, and once we quantify them, can we visualize them in a way so that the decision maker can look at that data and, and make sense of it? Now, if you, this, this shows only three conflicting objectives for a piece of forest land. One is uh, revenue maximization, carbon sequestration, and the third is old forest habitat. So it, this, even just looking at these three conflicting objectives, you need to have, or at least that's what we had thought, you need to have a three-dimensional rendering <coughs> of, uh, of these, these trade-offs whereby each of these points represent a the management alternative, a hundred-year-long 
spatially and temporally explicit management plan that would lead to different bundles, different combinations of these three outputs. So how can we visualize this in a way so that the decision maker can pick one of these and say, oh, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and so, yeah, <laughs> and, and so it's, it's unfortunate that you know, I had not had the chance to re-optimize my presentation because now I could show you some of the visual, visualization Seven solutions <laughs> in, in any number of n dimensions. So, so basically, uh, we developed these tools that are interactive where you can go in and I can s send you guys the links to these tools and zoom in to this uh, production frontier. You can move it around. You can, you can project it into lower dimensions. So this is a three-dimensional frontier, but you can project it to the sides and then play with that data. So we've worked a lot on this. And so that's why it was, this was very exciting and, and, and interesting to listen to Cecilia's presentation, because since we are from the same university, maybe we can, maybe she can give me some stuff for free. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I can take credit you know, for, you know, in my future presentations. <laughs> Anyway, um, so again, going back to what we're going to try to do here in Chile is, you know, some of Andres' work concerned the, the, uh, the challenge of, in forest operations, you, you try to figure out which forest stands to cut and when and how, but also how do you build and maintain a, a road network in order to extract that wood. And, and traditionally, those two sets of decisions, when and where, what, how to cut, and how to deal with the forest road network, those decisions had been optimized independently from each other. And so Andres's work was, uh, was um, um, uh, uh, very important in the, in the sense that they, he, he connected these two sets of decisions, integrated the two sets of decisions, so that, so that the, the end result allows an interaction between these sets of decisions in such a way so that the, 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 uh, the management plan is more is is closer to the true global optimum of of of, of that prescriptive model, and and now they've taken this even one step further uh, by by incorporating the notion that some of the input data um, uh, that feeds this integrated optim spatial optimization model is stochastic, right? Prices change, um, uh, demand for different forest products change. There is fire. Right, and and now what what we try to do here, uh, uh, with me being here for a year, is is to see how we can develop scenarios, different scenarios along different climate change project, project, uh, projections. Climate change can decrease or increase the projected yield of a forest stand. It can reduce the lifespan of a forest road segment just because there are big storms or, or fire that, that destroys a link, that destroys a culvert or destroys a bridge, and then you can no longer access a forest stand that was actually part of your forest management plan reducing revenues. And so, so they've done some, some pioneering work on, on how to account for these stochasticities, and, uh, and what I'm interested in now is to use those research achievements to to try to price I have six minutes seven seven try to price climate the climate change into the discount rate that is being used in these in these analyses in these optimization models so discount rates are typically set based on market forces this is the this is the the rate of return that a forest manager might want to get out of these forest operations, uh, a rate that actually matches his or her best alternative rate. Now, whenever there is a risk associated with some of these operations, they often say, "Okay, let's price, let's hedge against that risk by increasing that interest rate." It's called the risk premium. Now, there's climate change. And as I mentioned, these forest plans span a century or even more. So the importance of that risk goes up as you go further, deeper into the future. So how can we account for that risk? What exactly that, how can we quantify that risk premium so that 
it can be used to build forest management plans that are more attentive to the various climate change scenarios that had been developed. And so um, I thought I would uh, not want to get into the, the technical details, but now I'm hearing a couple of presentations. I see that uh, that maybe I should to you know to to to, to generate some 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 conversation about this. But but stochastic optimization models work in a way that they they look at a number a finite number of scenarios, like climate change scenario one, two, three, four, five. Some of them are more severe than the others. Some of them are, are more destructive in future periods than the others. Others materialize earlier. So in any case, in a, in a temporal model, and this is time on the horizontal axis, discretized time, because decisions, we try to schedule the decisions from time step to time step, typ typically 10, 10 year, in 10, 10 year time steps. So that's the temporal resolution of these models. And so these nodes, uh, are, are lined up along these, these 10, these cadal uh, units, and, and they, the, the path that, that you can take through these nodes along these arrows represent a climate change scenario, right? And so the, the, the mathematical structure of the model that tries to, to, um, to incorporate all of these scenarios in the decision model pays attention to, okay, which, which scenarios actually have a common, common path. For example, those S1, 2, and 3 start, and this is exactly the same. So you can't anticipate that change. And so we, we build in something called non-anticipativity constraints that require that the optimal decisions from up to this node must be the same for these three scenarios, since up to that point you have no idea which one is going to materialize. So. So solving these stochastic models is, 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 is quite hard. And so my plan here uh, this year is to, is to take the solutions from these stochastic models and try to replicate those solutions using purely deterministic models by adjusting the interest rate, the discount rate, on a forest stand and forest road link basis so that we would get exactly the same solution and we can tell the agencies for their future reference, that this is how you should price uh, risk premiums for their forest management units across the landscape and forest road links. So it's a very ambitious plan. I've just uh, I've just thought about the algorithm uh, on the on on the metro the other day. I was coming back and shared it with Andres and Marcos, the other collaborator. And uh, so this is where it is. But I hope that until by the end of the year, I have more than that to, to present. Um, well, thank you very much for your attention. I also, I don't know, can you play this? It's a video, actually. Sure, yeah. So I just want to reiter reiterate how much fun I have been having here in Chile. Uh, is it working? Yeah. And so this is just one of the highlights. This is the Universidad de Chile football club, and Andres <laughs> is on the board for the club, so he was generous enough to take me to this game, and I haven't been to a soccer, soccer game, game for decades. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I have to say it was amazing. I, was, uh, I had the, 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 the opportunity to sit with um, uh, Alberto Quintaro, who is, uh, was uh, uh, on the national, Chilean national team and played against Germany in the 1974 uh, World Cup. So, Thank you so much to Fulbright and to my host for 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 giving me this this incredible uh, experience. Thank you.